Come on, Rob. And we are now live. All right, thanks, Alex. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, before we begin tonight's meeting, I'd like to note that due to the COVID-19 emergency, this, uh, this meeting of HIS Council is being held electronically and live streamed on the town's website. All members of council in attendance are participating by audio and video teleconference and senior town staff are available throughout the meeting if council members have any questions on the agenda. For members of the public watching from home, please bear with us as if we encounter any technical difficulties throughout the meeting. Let's call this meeting to order. I'd like to begin this meeting by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is situated within the traditional and treaty territories of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island and the Chippewas of the Anishinaabe, known today as Williams Treaty First Nation. This place is and will continue to be home to Indigenous peoples. Let us move forward together with kindness and respect. And before we get on to the agenda, I think it's appropriate that we have a, a minute of silence to in honor, not in honor, in respect of the unfortunate 18 Canadians who lost their lives in the uh, unfortunate shooting in, in Nova Scotia. So. Thank you, everyone. And our thoughts are with all the, uh, the family of those who were lost. <clears throat> Do we have any disclosure of pecuniary interest? No. Being none, moving on to the minutes. We have moved by Councillor Bauer, second by Councillor Lee, that the minutes of the regional meeting of council held on February 24th be adopted. Any questions or comments on the February 24th meeting? Seeing none, those in favor? None opposed, that's carried, thank you. Moving on to the minutes of our special meeting of March 17, 2020, we have moved by Regional Councilor Crawford, second by Councilor Tyler Morin, that the minutes of the special meeting of council held on March 17, 2020 be adopted. Any questions or comments on the minutes? Being none, those in favor? None opposed, carried, thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to question period, we had put out to the public that if anybody had any questions or members of the public, they would submit them to the clerk by noon today. No questions have been received, so we'll not proceed with question period. Moving on to departmental reports. Uh, section 5.1, Proposed Community Benefits Charge Regulations and the Town of Ajax Comments. We have moved by Councillor Kahn, seconded by Councillor Dyes, that the report entitled Proposed Community Benefits Charge Regulations, Town of Ajax Comments be received for information. Any questions for staff? Being none, I do. Sorry, uh, Chair? Yes. I actually had a question, sorry. I, didn't, I was raising my hand, I should have spoken up. Um, through the chair to staff, uh, first things first, it's very nice to see all of council in this uh, historic uh, event of doing uh, the first video uh, council meeting. Um, secondly, to staff, uh, in regards um, to the community benefits charge, first, uh, I'm, I'm very happy the province relented in changing the way the um, CBC was going to be implemented because ultimately it would have had a huge negative impact on our library funds and community center growth. Um, my question is um, they had mentioned that we would ultimately need to hire a consultant to complete a CBC strategy and bylaw review. Would the consultant be paid for by the province or the municipality? Uh, can everybody hear me? Mr. Romanowski? Yeah, we yes. can hear you. Great. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, that Sean McCulloch, uh, author of the report, respond to that question. Mr. McCulloch? Can everyone hear me? Hi, yeah. Sean. Hi, everyone. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, similar to our development charge background study, the town would be responsible uh, for prepare, hiring a consultant to prepare uh, the CBC strategy and the bylaw. Uh, the town has budgeted $160,000 in 2020 for this project, 
And at this time, 90% of this project is anticipated to be funded from development charge and CBC collections, and the rest would be funded from town reserves. Uh, municipalities are still waiting on confirmation on whether uh, the studies will be considered eligible as an expenditure under the CBC so that moving forward, we would be able to fund uh, future studies under the CBC charge. And through the chair then, and thank you, Sean, for that. Typically, is it, would it fall under the notes section that the town gives to the province to ask that the province fund 50% of it, 75% of it, 100% of it? Or do we generally just accept that it's up to the municipality to pay for these um, studies? Uh, through the chair, normally it's common practice that these studies would be funded uh, by the municipality. And as uh, I mentioned just a moment ago, it would be funded by the, pro the study moving forward. Um, if you were looking for the province to fund uh, aspects of the uh, study, that could be included in the comments back to the province, looking for um, provincial contributions moving forward. I don't think it's necessarily out of line to, for that ask. And then, I guess I'll leave it up to council to possibly correct me, but um, these changes were as a result of the province implementing 108 and then in a sense backtracking. And now we have to update our bylaw to reflect those reflect those respective changes to the tune of $160,000. And I think it's, especially now we, we don't know what 2021 or the finances going forward are going to be like because of COVID-19 um, to, to put a comment in that the province possibly look into a rebate system or pay for some of it. I personally don't think it's out of line, but I think I'll wait for the rest of the comments before I put forward any sort of amendment. Just see if there's an appetite for it. Um, but thank you, Chair, those are all my questions. Thank you, Sean. Okay, any other comments to staff or questions? Yes, if I may. You go, Councilor Dyes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in, in your notes, you speak to um, the maximum 10% value of property that's being developed for acquiring lands for parks. And I know that also has a financial impact on the town. Can you clarify that for people who are listening tonight? Because I think there is some interest in that. Ms. McCullough? Sean, I, again, I'll get Sean as the author of the report to respond to Councillor Dyes with regards to the question about uh, parkland. Yep, so through you, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. Um, historically, the town has been able to collect an alternative parkland rate um, that was collected based on density. So under the current proposal that continues to be proposed to be removed from the Planning Act. And after a review of some of the development applications that the town has received over the last couple of years, and a comparison of the uh, land value of those projects uh, compared to the amount of parkland that had been collected, um, in, most in, in almost all the instances, the amount exceeded the 10% that is being proposed to be uh, collected through the community benefit charge strategy. One other question I had, if I may. Um, so the financial impact, I understand it, it you know, as land it differs, the cost of land differs in different municipalities to give us that blank 10% could cause a problem, particularly with intensification when the development is worth, you know, a different sum. It depends on the area. So I was concerned about that and also about being able to accept parkland in kind and wondered how that works and in kind contribution where you have to have the town and the developer agree on that in kind contribution. There's different interests there. Through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, it, currently the town has the ability to impose um, a condition requiring the parkland be provided. Uh, under the proposed, the town had commented in pre previously that um, we had requested that the province allow us to accept in-kind contributions. Um, however, it was our intention that that would be at our sole discretion. Under this current proposal, there would have to be some sort of mutual agreement. and. And although staff do strive to work with our development community to find mutually agreeable and beneficial developments, there may be instances where our official plan has identified locations for parkland 
And there may be instances where developers are not willing to make those contributions. Um, so we are asking the province that the in-kind contribution in that decision uh, be left with the municipality. Okay, thank you. That's important. Thank you. Regional Councillor Crawford. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say that I, I like the idea of what Regional Councillor uh, Lee was talking about. I think that uh, it wouldn't ever hurt to actually ask for this. You may not get it, but you certainly won't get it if you don't ask. So especially given the challenges that a lot of the municipalities are going to have over the 2020 year given this year, I think uh, if there's going to be a motion, I'd be definitely in support of that. Okay. Anything further? I have uh, just some questions to staff um, to uh, Mr. Romanowski, and just just that I, I suspect there's going to be an amendment to this, and I would support the amendment because I think if there is costs incurred based on a change, that those costs should not be borne by the municipality. But to the timing. These comments have already been submitted to the province on April the 17th. And I'm wondering why we're being asked to endorse this tonight, yet it's already been submitted and any amendments that we make are now after the fact. And I asked this after checking online that uh, it says in a report twice that it's done to meet the deadline, but the deadline is 1159 tonight. So there's no reason why this could not have been submitted after we approved it with our amendments. Um, Mr. Romanowski, could you comment to that, please? Uh, yes, I can, uh, through the chair. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we got the comments forward. Just because we forward the comments ahead of time doesn't mean that we can, can't provide addendums to those comments or additional comments in addition to those. We did uh, realize that uh, although the comment period is done at 11.59 tonight. Uh, we wanna be proactive and get our comments to the province in order for us to ensure that our comments are submitted on time. But we definitely can uh, make any adjustments uh, through any of the direction received by council this evening and forward those on uh, with a revised set of our comments indicating to the province that this, this set is the set that they should be referring to going forward. Okay, in future, uh, I would prefer that we, we just go the route with the original, not have an amended or supplementary list after, if the deadline comes after the council meeting, just to make it cleaner and make sure that there's no, I guess, misunderstanding or anybody mixes it up. Those are my comments. Uh, Regent Council Lee, do you have an amendment? Um, yes, Chair. Um, through the Chair to the Clerk, do you need this in writing or I can just verbalize it? You can verbalize it. I'll write it on here. Thank you. Um, um, so moved by myself, seconded by Regional Councillor Crawford, that um, comments to the um, province reflect um, an ask, if you will, for the province to either reimburse in full or in part the, um, the uh, study for uh, the costs of the CBC or the C yeah, Community Benefits Charge. Okay. You wish to speak to it or? No, I, I think just, I've already spoken to in terms of just, um, we are gonna go through some very hard times coming up in the next year and forward and every little bit helps. And this is something that um, we are forced to update as a result of provincial policy. And as a result, I'm hoping the province can come to the table and help out municipalities with um, this added cost. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Clerk, did you get that? Yes, we've got it. Thank you. Okay. I've just put that any costs related to the updating of the policy be reimbursed from the province as our final comment. Any, any questions or comments on the amendment? Seeing none, those in favor of the amendment? That is carried. On the main motion, as amended, anybody wish to speak to it? Okay, those in favor of the main motion as amended? Hands please, there we go, that's carried, thank you. Moving on to departmental report 5.2, Bill 108, more homes, more homes, more choices, act status update. 
We have moved by Regional Council Lee, second by Council Tyler Moran, for the report entitled Bill 108, More Homes, More Choices Act 2019 Status Update be received for information. Questions, comments? Regional Council Lee. Thank you, Chair. Through the Chair to staff, and I suppose it's Sean again. Um, Bill 108 has been a contentious issue with the town, not contentious, but we've brought this up in a few meetings of what's the impact to the town? What does this mean? What does this mean? And I think we're getting more and more clarity now, which is great. My question is, um, through the updates to the LPAT slash OMB system. So since the town, since um, 108 was um, incepted in September, have we, has the town gone to the, I guess the LPAT as it is now since, um, and what has been the result of those um, hearings? Uh, thank you. Through the chair, I'll refer to Sean to answer Mr. Uh, Sterling Lee's question. Ms. McCullough. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, since September 2019, the town hasn't received any um, appeals that would be impacted by these changes. Um, however, the, the process that was implemented through Bill 108 is in fact the old Ontario Municipal Board process, um, which the town has a lot of experience uh, dealing with historically. Um, so we have had a lot of experience dealing with um, this type of process before. As a follow-up uh, chair um, to staff, do we find that the OMB process is uh, more beneficial to the town or do you find the LPAT system is more beneficial to the town? And can you kind of elaborate, um, let's say to anybody streaming for the first time, um, what does that mean for them or what is it like what is the end user result of the change yes thank you through you mr chair so when the ontario when the province transitioned from the ontario municipal board to the local planning appeals tribunal um, the local planning appeals tribunal was originally intended um, to be a true appeals mechanism in that uh, hearings would no longer be de novo in that you have one board member making a decision on an application. It was to look at what a council's decision was and determine whether or not that decision was consistent with provincial um, policy and local policy. This new process would also have relied heavily on uh, written materials and there would have been uh, limits on oral submissions and cross-examination. So for us, this would have resulted in drastically shorter hearings uh, reducing the cost associated with legal expenses and staff time. So to that end, the town was very supportive in the past of the uh, local planning appeals tribunal process as it was originally intended, as it would have, um, again, acted as that true appeals mechanism um, and potentially save the town uh, resources and money. That's very helpful. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, staff. Okay, anything further? I have a question, please. Yep, Regional Council does. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, we pre I very much appreciate the work you've done. These reports are really thorough. I just had a question about inclusionary zoning where um, they've been limited uh, to major transit stations and that's for affordable housing. So I'm wondering where else in the town other than the GO station would you consider, what would you consider a major transit station so that we have the ability to have more than one area for affordable housing? So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, unfortunately the town only has one major transit station area and that is the Ajax GO station. So with this limit, we would only be able to apply it in that location. So a pulse, the pulse on Kingston Road wouldn't sort of fit that category where it is rapid transit in a sense and any of, of the other major arterial, arterial roads? <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Chair, currently uh, that isn't identified as a major transit station area. Um, we do see in the future, likely the next municipal comprehensive re review that that will, those stations along that route will eventually become major transit station areas. Um, however, the way provincial policy is currently, it's only the Ajax GO station, unfortunately. So just to clarify, we can't have any subsidized housing, say within our communities, our neighbor, <coughs> excuse me, our, our separate neighborhoods. Through you, Mr. Chair, using the inclusionary zoning, uh, that's correct. We would only be able to use it in the Ajax GO station. Very short-sighted, thank you. Any other comments? Nope, thank you. Anybody else? 
I just have, um, just to follow up on that, Ms. McCullough. In our comments, because I would suggest that this would probably make a good comment, and I don't know if it's appropriate to wait another five years till the next MCR, but I'm just thinking Council Regional Council Dyes is right as far as our main corridors, and we already do address this in our comments for major regional roads. And through and we we ask for intensification through major regional roads, but we don't talk about subsidized housing. Would this not be appropriate to have one of our comments? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, you are correct. We we have been supportive of increased intensification along the regional corridors, and we have been um, we have submitted comments to the region on encouraging uh, transit designations along those future corridors, so we can start building up to what they will eventually become. Um, but that's definitely something that we can submit to the uh, the region as part of the municipal comprehensive review, and have them look at encouraging. Um, different types of affordable housing in the intensification areas. It wouldn't be the mechanism of the inclusionary zoning. We have asked the province through our current comments that or in the past that inclusionary zoning be permitted in all strategic growth areas, um, but that's a comment that was ignored by the province. I'm thinking <clears throat> to give an example, the, uh, the Durham Center and we know that the, the current big box models are going to be changed and probably going to be looking at putting more um, higher density, seniors housing, long-term care, other things in some of those areas um, as things, especially now as things are going more and more online ordering and less people are going to these big box stores. But by only allowing subsidized housing in the go node, that, that's really limiting. Do you have any other suggestions? Because even if we make this comment to the region through the MCR process, it's still going to be um, several years away. There's no way to get it in as far as through the um, Bill 108 consultation? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, no, the comments on the Bill 108 consultation um, have already closed. Uh, this was just an update on some of those changes that have already happened. Uh, these are comments that we had submitted last year and uh, the results were not in our favor and hoping that we would see some more options for um, larger geographical areas to apply some of those, um, those mechanisms. But certainly moving forward as we move through the region's process and we look at our own um, tools that we have, we can certainly, um, staff would be supportive of encouraging affordable housing in those areas suggested because those are our strategic growth areas and we really are hoping that they develop into um, affordable, complete communities. Okay, I, I would suspect that the same question might get asked in the next departmental report 5.3. Um, moving on to the report, we, it's moved by Regional Council Lee, seconded by Council Title Moore. Anything further on the report? Seeing none, those in favor? None, none opposed, carried. Thank you. We've gone to departmental report 5.3, Envision Durham Municipal Conference Review, Town of Ajax comments on the environmental, on the environment and Greenland system, transportation systems and housing policy discussion papers. Any questions, comments to staff? Regional Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. Um, through the, our, our, it's, you know, Envision Durham is gonna outline the next, many, many years of development within Durham and transportation will be a key part of that. My question was whether we, um, Ajax had included any notes regarding carpooling um, to the GO station or whatnot, or setting up a carpool system. I know if I'm not mistaken, if you go to the Durham region website, um, they, we work with a third party to set up carpools, but I only found that out through this report when I looked it up myself. It's not something that we seem to actively um, promote. And I think that's a missed opportunity as I'm sure many people within the same neighborhood go to the GO station and we can reduce a lot of the gridlock by at least carpooling or setting up some sort of carpool system. So I'm just curious to what um, staff's, um, staff's thoughts were on a carpool, a more uh, organized carpool program within the region. Um, Ms. McCullough, is that still for you? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, that one would be me as well. Um, certainly through you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, the discussion paper it did have a lot of discussion on transportation demand management measures, uh, such as the Smart Commute Program. Uh, it also questioned what the region's role should be in providing carpool lots uh, throughout the region. I think they identified a handful of locations that they do currently have. Um, and then the discussion paper also touched on um, the region's current transportation demand management plan and some of those measures um, such as the smart commute and expanding it through pilot projects with employers so that it can reach more users. So our comment specifically with this discussion paper was that uh, staff did support carpool lots, um, especially in areas not well served by transit. And we also supported the expansion of TDM measures being offered by the region. Um, the town's transportation staff are heavily involved in working with um, programs like Smart Commute, trying to get that word out and um, encouraging transportation demand management measures through our development application. So that's something that they do uh, routinely as well. That's great. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, staff. Okay, uh, Rachel Council Dice. Thank you. So I guess really just a comment um, about you're introducing uh, or they're introducing a policy that discourages dumping of fill. And I've seen firsthand, and as you have, Mr. Mayor, when we've had a tour with TRCA on the headwaters of the Crothers, that the fill from development that's happening all around us is going into the green belt, into our agricultural lands as well. And it's really changing the landscape and not for the better. It has changed the grading of the land in some instances, and we don't really know what the quality of that fill is. It could be contaminated. So right now, my understanding is that as a municipality, if it's in our jurisdiction, it's a bylaw issue. Is that correct? Yes. Sorry, you missed. Uh, yeah, sorry. through the chair. Sorry, Sean, I'll jump in here. But yes, through the chair, uh, any movement of fill on lands uh, are subject to sediment or erosion control uh, bylaw. They would need to get a permit to do that work to move dirt around or bring fill into the site. That uh, usually comes through some type of complaint through the bylaw department, then it's passed on through planning. And then we go through that process to ensure that that, that process is kind of um, monitored, appropriate uh, sediment erosion control fencing, that type of stuff is put up if required. So is there an ability then to work with different levels of government to have, to find a better solution because you, you kind of have to be there or as you say on a complaint basis, but you really have to catch them in the act because what they're doing is they're paying, you know, landowners to take a truckload of soil and some take more than others. So it's very difficult for our bylaw to manage yet that, yet we, have, we will feel the impact downstream. And we're also paying, you know, when, when you're looking at these watersheds and, and the work that has to be done to mitigate some of the impacts of, you know, uh, riparian growth or development or whatever the impact is on our watersheds, we're now looking at a study on Carruthers that's gonna say what we have to do to improve the watershed. So to me, it's a really, really big, big issue that never seems to be addressed. And I'm wondering if, if you've ever had that sort of collaborative, uh, collaborative approach with the region and, and other in Pickering perhaps as well. Not so much with the region through the chair to Councillor Dyes, not so much with the region. Uh, we tend to maybe team up with these issues more often than not with the respective conservation authorities is they typically get involved if there's dirt being moved around on properties, especially if they're adjacent to any natural heritage features or water courses or wooded areas. Typically it's just between uh, the municipality, the bylaw officers for the municipality and the enforcement officers with the conservation authority. We usually work through those channels to ensure that people are following the rules, getting the right permits, putting the dirt in the right spot, providing the right plans. Uh, so we understand the volume of dirt that's being pushed around and, and, and keeping it away from areas that could be negatively impacted. Well, the one I saw was a wetland and they had raised it you know, many feet so that when they did have an intense rain, it flooded the road underneath. So I think it's something we, we may 
consider looking at a little differently and see if we can manage it a little better. It, I, I know it's not just on us. I think we have partners that are also concerned about this issue. So thank you, appreciate your answer. Okay, are there any other members of council? Questions, comments for staff? Uh, Regional Councilor Dyes, would you like to move an amendment um, to the section three, which is something along the lines of that the region be encouraged to have more areas for, I guess, low income or subsidized housing focused around major transit routes? I think well, yes, I, I would like to make an amendment, but I think that it's it's really up to the um, municipality to make those decisions because we're also very different in how our communities have been uh, developed over the years. I think it's a big mistake to say just in this one area specifically because we know from past history that that's problematic. You're putting everything in one area and it has not worked in the past. And uh, that's why we, we have a mix of housing now. So I'm not sure how you want to amend that. I, um, I, I really think the responsibility should be, back, should be given to the uh, individual municipalities to make those decisions. Obviously, you're going to have some in that major transit corridor, but not all of them. Yeah, but right now, according to, to this, it's only in the go node. And... Yeah. In order to, as Ms. McCullough said, that's going to be one of the staff's recommendations to the region during the municipal comprehensive review process, is that it be encouraged in other areas like along transit routes, but that's not currently in this report. No, I agree. Yeah, it should be encouraged in other areas. Um, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, uh, you know, transit areas because obviously we have good transit, don't we? <laughs> So we all live within the good transit area. <laughs> okay. Well, I think staff, uh, Mr. McCullough and Mr. Romanowski, can you take that as uh, direction? Yes, we can. I just, uh, I just want to make sure that we were talking about the right, uh, the right report, because I think the MTSA inclusive. Uh, inclusionary zoning was the second report that we dealt with, and this is the third report that we're deal dealing with. Am I correct? This is the last yeah. one we did was, yeah, I believe you are, but this is the so comment. Right. The other one was Bill 108. This is the one on Avisio Durham and the housing policy discussion papers. Okay, so yes, we definitely can take that direction forward. There are comments are around that the region consider increasing affordable housing targets uh, spe in specific geographic locations, such as strategic growth areas. So this would be in our downtown area that are well served by transit. So that is part of our comments, but we can enhance that comment uh, based on council's direction and provide that going forward. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank so this you. is moved by Councillor Kahn, second by Councillor Bauer. <clears throat> That the report entitled Excuse Division me, Durham. Pardon? Sorry, sorry, Mayor. I just had a question that I wanted to ask. Yep, go ahead. I'm sorry, thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you for the report. Um, very interesting. I was just thinking about it. Now that we are a month into our new reality, these comments were all posted or created, I guess, pre pandemic. And if we look at it, now that we have we have a different lens possibly that we could be looking at issues and planning and discussion and comments. So I'm just wondering, are these comments closed now? And if we do have things that we are learning as we are learning, thing, you know, as we are going through this crazy time every day, uh, do we have the opportunity to have another look and perhaps there's something um, that we've missed or that we've learned or that we wanna, you know, answer a, a question differently as a result of what we're going through? I don't, I don't know who could answer that. I guess the question is if once we have a chance to, or as we review what's going on, it may change or, or give us an opportunity or, or we have something additional that we wanna add that's not in these comments because the comments first. 
is the period to discuss this closed or can we reopen it? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, with the Envision Durham process, it's, it's ongoing and this is just the discussion phase. The region has been open to accepting comments after their deadlines um, so that they make sure that they it results in an official plan that's representative of the region. So if there are comments that come up, well, we still will have the opportunity to uh, submit those comments and work with our colleagues at the region. Um, and then there will also be future amendments that come forward um, that there will be another opportunity to comment at that time as well. And, and also through the chair, do you, Councillor Bauer, I think what we're seeing just in general, not, not specific to any one report that planning has before council this evening, but definitely the circumstance, COVID circumstance that we're under, they're, they're, those discussions are having being had at, out within a lot of planning departments, looking at our policy, looking at how, how we do business, just this alone tonight on, you know, virtual council meetings. I think it, I think it's, it's a fulsome discussion. I don't think it's in any one particular area of the municipality, but uh, we're definitely seeing that trend of the COVID-19 situation and, and looking at these uh, times and how we can improve upon them and, and take the lessons that we're learning going to go forward with. Great, thank you very much. All right, anything further? Okay, being none. Moved by Councillor Kahn, seconded by Councillor Bauer. The report entitled Envision Durham Municipal Conference Review, Town of Ajax comments be received for information and that staff's comments be endorsed. Those in favor? None opposed, that is carried. Moving on to departmental report 5.4, contract award T20009, local road resurfacing 2020, neighborhood street light improvements and geotechnical services. Any questions or comments to staff on this? Regional Councilor Crawford. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is on the roads that are actually being resurfaced. Um, I'm not sure who would answer this, but I know that we have had multiple discussions around Brennan Road, and I don't see this uh, as being one of the roads that are going to be tackled this time. And uh, I just, I'd like to have an understanding of why. Ms. Bridgman, can you speak to Brennan Road and where it falls in our pavement management strategy? Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, thank you for the question, Councillor Crawford. Um, on an annual basis, the town um, views and completes a scan of our road network um, and prioritizes all of the roads in the network. Um, Brennan is in the long range capital forecast, but was not scheduled for 2020. Do you know when it's scheduled, Catherine? I do not have that information off the top of my head, but I can provide that information to Councillor Crawford um, tomorrow. I believe it was 2023, but I thought that we had had some discussions about that being moved up. It, uh, there was an error in the detail sheet and we have communicated with a local resident and uh, spoke to uh, a few people in regards to that road. Um, it has been uh, scheduled in the 2022, I believe, or 2021. I'm not sure. Again, I'd like to verify that data before I confirm. But it is not in 2023. It's definitely in the, it's in the long range capital forecast, but it's not scheduled to be completed this year. I'd have to get the information to you. Okay, thank you. No problem. Sure. Any further questions to staff? Being none, moved by Regional Councilor Dye, seconded by Regional Councilor Crawford. The Council award the contract for road resurfacing 2020 to Sea Valley Paving in the amount of $733,577.52, inclusive of taxes. Two, the Council award the contract for Roslyn Road Top Asphalt, West Town Limit to Church Street to Sea Valley Paving in the amount of $495,838.58, inclusive of taxes. Three, the council award the contract for neighborhood streetlight improvements to Sea Valley Paving in the amount of $347,301.83, inclusive of taxes. And four, the council award the contract for geotechnical work to Cambium Inc. in the amount of $19,896.70, inclusive of all taxes. Those in favor? 
None opposed. Carried. Thank you. And moving on to 5.6, final report, contract award, Highway 2, Bus Rapid Transit, Street Lighting. Any questions to set up? Uh, moved by Regent Council Crawford, second by Council Bauer, that the report on net over expenditure of $48,055.94 for the supply and installation of streetlights uh, be received for information. And we approve the following funding to be allocated to capital account 100711 from the development charge for roads and development reserve. Those in favor? None opposed? Carried. We are on 5.6, contract award supply and delivery of the pumper rescue fire truck. Questions or comments, Mr. Lang? Being done, being none, moved by Councillor Khan, second by Regional Councillor Lee. The council will award the contract for the supply and delivery of a pumper slash rescue fire truck to dependable emergency vehicles in the amount of 1.162 million, inclusive of all taxes, and two, the council approved funding of 71,957 to be allocated to capital account 1008011 from vehicle equipment replacement reserve. Those in favor? None opposed, carry. And the final departmental report, COVID-19 response update from CAO Baker. Any questions to Mr. Baker? Uh, Regional Councilor Crawford. Okay, just bear with me. I gotta try to work two screens on one. Hang on. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just reading here. Uh, the town is one of two municipalities in the region offering a specialized hygiene hub for local unsheltered population. Uh, that is supposed to be starting this week, am I correct? Uh, Mr. Baker? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, we had planned to start it this week. Uh, unfortunately, the region was not uh, ready to go. Our staff uh, worked hard and are still working hard with the region to be able to get the, uh, the hub up and running. And we're actually waiting for them now to, uh, to get all of their, all of their uh, items aligned so that we can open up the doors. I think it's very exciting. I'm just curious, will we get some um, kind of information on how that actually rolls out? I'm, I, I'm going to pass that on to uh, Director Vaughn. She's been uh, in conversation with the region, so she, she should be able to answer your question in that regard. Okay, thank you. Ms. Vaughn? Good evening, everyone. Uh, through the chair, to mm -hmm. Councillor Crawford. Um, yep, we are uh, currently working with the region on a number of the details. We wanted to be clear that um, everything was fully in place before we opened our doors. We certainly will be able to give council a uh, high level overview of the types of services that will be provided in the hub. Um, what I can tell you at this time is that the hub is sort of um, has uh, two purposes. One is it provides a screening function and a health check function for the unsheltered population. So there will be an opportunity for individuals um, to go through screening. If they do have any potential symptoms for COVID, they will be connected directly with public health staff who can assist them from a health perspective, and get them to the right place to get the right support at the right time. Um, then the hub also will serve as an opportunity for hygiene, so showers, bathrooms, accessing uh, basic necessities, as well as some other supports like food, uh, mental health, crisis intervention, things of that nature. So can it, as you can imagine, there's a number of moving parts to, mm -hmm. to uh, get together. There's a couple of agencies that will need to be uh, big players in this. So it's really, um, the region is uh, working really diligently to get all of those pieces put together. But as soon as we have all of those plans finalized, we would be happy to share an update with council so that you understand what's happening and how we'll be positioned to serve the community. That's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I have a couple of other questions. Is that okay? Go ahead. Wanna, huh? Okay. Go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to say that I, I really thought that our business uh, live telephone hall was, was good. I thought it was informative both for businesses and for us to understand the, input, the problems that businesses are having. Um, 
I'm hoping that we're going to see more of that. I'd love to see it more in a webinar kind of uh, situation so that it's a little bit better for interaction. Um, and I'm hoping that that's just something that we can do in the future. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, I noticed was that there was a local support local business campaign. What exactly, what exactly is that? How are we doing that? Mr. Baker? You, Mr. Mayor, I will pass this on to uh, Director, Acting Director Romanowski, but it's my understanding that we received a, um, uh, a uh, request from our economic development staff to try and encourage people to uh, shop locally as much as possible. And we, we asked ask them to you know, give us some examples of different types of businesses that are still open that they can, they, they can access. Uh, I'm not sure that was the last I heard, but I'm not sure where we are with that that initiative. But perhaps uh, Jeff can fill in the blanks. Yes. Yeah, I'm just I'm curious, Jeff. I'm, I am. Thank you. I just is is economic development running this campaign? They're working on this campaign. I I think communications is part of this as well, but it's mostly in the ECD side of things. Uh, there's three main themes. Uh, with the whole support local campaign that's now out on social media. So there's many ways for residents to support local businesses from home, promoting businesses that are helping with the COVID-19 efforts. So this would be mm -hmm. things such as supporting our frontline workers in the most vulnerable uh, segments of our population. The, the third theme is promoting businesses that are supporting each other in unique ways. So the sharing of stories, tag, hashtag Ajax Advantage and at Town of Ajax, and also connecting through our website, uh, ajax.ca slash business for stories and updates. So that's how we're, we're working the, the support local campaign. So I'm assuming that this is a fairly new kind of uh, venture, is that is that fair to say? Yeah, it's been kind of the last kind of two and a half, three weeks that we've put information together through ECD. They've been running that um, mostly on their own as part of their normal standard ECD reaching out to businesses processes. Okay, I just think I'm, I'm very happy to hear that because I think that especially some of our small businesses, they're in so much, uh, so much uh, stress at this point, trying to figure out how to keep things open and keep their their businesses and employees employed. I do really want to say that I'm so impressed with our larger local businesses that are giving uh, huge like uh, Saffron landing systems and Katrina's and OPG and all of the businesses that are out there really helping and supporting Lake Ridge Health. So uh, I just want to shout out to them too. But thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. And thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Uh, Regional Councillor Dice. Thank you. I just wanted a follow-up question on the hub, if I may. Um, Ms. Vaughn, I, I realized when it first came out, the information was also about connecting um, people with different programs in the community. Is that still part of the hub? Thank you. Uh, through the chair to Regional Councillor Dice. Absolutely. Um, what will happen when, um, when the um, individuals come into the hub, there will be a basics uh, check-in with them to see what it is that they need access to, what they have access to. And we will be working really closely with local agencies to um, match the needs of the clients who are coming in with the local agencies that are out there. So there will be sort of an information and referral type uh, behavior that will be happening on the part of our agencies and we will also have um, agency staff available in the hub to answer questions and provide service. So we're, we're taking sort of a staged approach and making sure that the case management and information and referral uh, piece is really um, put together really well and then plugging in agencies as we start to see what the themes are and what the needs are that continue to emerge. So I would definitely see this building and growing, which is one of the reasons uh, we use the uh, location that we are using so we can continue to add services as they become uh, necessary. Well, I I'm pleased to hear that. Will that mean you will also look at gaps 
for example, um, there are certain times of the day where there are programs available that they can um, access, but there are a few hours in the day and the evening when there's nowhere for them to go. Yet, we know you can't sit down in a park or on a bench at a picnic table. There are regulations, COVID regulations. So it's really difficult for people who are without a home um, when there's absolutely nowhere for them to go. So is this going to be something that will be taken into consideration? I think the DAC committee was supposed to review that, but I didn't see it in their meetings. Thank you through the chair to regional councillor Dyes. Absolutely. One of the conversations we've had with both the region and with um, the main uh, organization who will be working with us in the hub is the real is the ability to, to capture real time information and do sort of a gap analysis, uh, sort of a strength based assessment and a gap analysis and identify where there are gaps in service, where there's overlap in service, where we need to identify other community partners who either need to come into the hub or how do we network the individuals accessing the hub to their services. So one of the examples is we talked about laundering facilities, for example. So if there's something that we may not necessarily have in the hub, but how do we connect the individuals using the hub to all of the other great community supports that are out there? So creating that map, creating that referral network is going to be really important. And we'll take sort of our daily logs and our daily um, activity sheets to be able to determine what needs are coming out that perhaps we haven't identified yet or haven't um, been able to find a provider for and be able to put those asks through the region and the, uh, the network to see who can meet those demands in a meaningful way, either in the hub or in, in connection and partnership with the hub. Thank you. I really appreciate the information. And I just have one last question <clears throat> and it's not related to this, but I did receive an inquiry from the Salvation Army about the COVID Action Fund. And while we may not have information on it, you're connected with the region and, and some of our um, not-for-profits. So you might be able to get some information for me. But the COVID Action Fund um, indicated that the money be distributed to uh, you know, the province, to local service managers. And then that changed. It seemed to be flowing through local programs um, that be allocated through the region. So the concern is that historically we know where the money goes. Oshawa gets a lot because they've always had the programs there and the need is there. But the Salvation Army does the food bank here. They have many other programs too, but the food bank is an issue right now. They were looking at increasing um, the food available because we know there's an increase in families and supply. They were looking at a process and I wondered if you could find out if there is a proposal process in place where, you know, different not-for-profits and different munis in our municipality can access a proposal to say exactly what their needs are and what they're looking for because Salvation Army is looking for four months of operational costs. So yes, they get the food from um, Feed the Need but it's not quite enough. So that comes out of their operational costs. And of course that's getting higher all the time. So I'd like to be able to find out that information for them uh, about regarding a proposal process. Thank you again, uh, through the chair to Thank regional you. counselor Dyes. I will follow up on that with you. You're quite correct in that the, uh, I think the not-for-profits are definitely struggling to navigate some of the funding announcements that have happened or understand where or when they're happening. Um, certainly something that we'll continue to raise uh, with the region and other funding partners. It was something we were talking about earlier today, but I will specifically uh, find out what, what, if any updates have come available and I'll send you um, information around in particular where the Salvation Army may be able to leverage the operational funds. Cause we've talked about that. It's one thing for agencies to be able to have the groceries, but it's another thing to have the staff to sort the groceries or ensure that they can get to the people that need them. So it's a point well taken. I will follow up um, and I will get you any information that I'm able to uh, ascertain from the region or the other partners. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Regional Councilor Lee. Thank you, Chair. Um, through the Chair to CAO Baker first, just wanna make a comment of, and actually to the entire um, staff and um, the mayor and everyone, for doing um, the impossible 
during unprecedented times. Um, I think it's very easy to armchair quarterback and say, oh, we should have done this sooner, we should have done that sooner. But I think now is more than ever is a time when we all need to come together. And I just want to thank uh, the mayor for his leadership and staff for doing a great job in ensuring the town of Ajax is running as best we can under these circumstances. My question ultimately is regarding um, an economic recovery task force. So Oshawa had just announced last week that they had instituted um, this type of task force. And I understand we're doing the webinars and to Maryland Regional Councilor Crawford's point, there, you know, we can extend them to, we can ex expand them, but I was hoping for a more formalized response um, from the town to look at recovery efforts um, for our small businesses. Now I understand, you know, we're still in this and I will be in this for the time being, but just what is the town doing to start at least looking at the next steps? Mr. Baker? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this was a discussion. I, I actually am on a conference call with the Durham Region CAOs on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and this was a conference discussion that we had last Thursday, and Oshawa talked about uh, what their plans are, and uh, the, the, the CAOs uh, um, you know, had a number of questions of how they were proceeding forward. This is obviously something that we need to address as we um, move through this process. Uh, you know, Recovery is a big part of any of any uh, emergency uh, situation. So um, this is a discussion piece that we will have at our uh, emergency operations control control group meetings as we move forward. And uh, and uh, we will definitely make sure that we keep uh, council up to date as we move to that phase. That's great. And my last question, um, something that Councilor Bauer brought up of almost um, a playbook for COVID, you know, like now that we're learning all these lessons that we never thought we had to learn previously um, from this experience, are we kind of keeping track of all these things so that we can kind of create a playbook, um, a summary as to what worked, what didn't work, what we would do differently should this happen again, um, so that future councils can be more prepared um, should the next disaster emergency happen? So absolutely, all of our, um, all of our, we have two different meetings that we uh, do every week. We do uh, COVID steering committee meetings that are recorded and we do um, via Zoom, of course, and we do our emergency <coughs> control group meetings as well, which are recorded. Um, so we, through those meetings, we make decisions of uh, all the different issues that we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And those are forwarded to you through your briefing notes as well as the uh, the end of the week decision trackers. Uh, but in addition to that, we are uh, taking minutes as well of all of those meetings. And we're gonna go back after this is all over, we're gonna go back and debrief and uh, and look at, you know, exactly what you're, exactly what you're uh, talking about, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what came out of left field that we weren't expecting, how did the, uh, how did residents, uh, you know, uh, react to different actions that we took so that we, have an idea of uh, you know what we might be facing if this ever happens again, or if we you know go to a second wave or or more. Um, but absolutely, that's all part of our process. That's great. Thank you, Chair. Uh, any other comments, Councilor Bauer? Thank you, Chair. I uh, I just wanted to comment. I wanted to thank everybody for their hard work. It's such a it's amazing to see everyone come together, take care of each other. And uh, just as the section of CAO Baker's report, the engaging with the community, I think the town has done a tremendous job. The website, social media, um, these live with the mayors, the phone calls, it's been a great sharing of information and an effort to make sure everyone feels informed and part of a community. And I also wanna give a shout out to the community itself and all of the groups, like if you go on Facebook and there's a, a group uh, monitoring the lineups at different stores, there's a group monitoring what restaurants are offering delivery or, or takeout. There's the group of care mongers or uh, South Ajax volunteers. Like it's just, I think it's amazing that everyone's coming together and I commend the town as well, because I see you on those social medias and you, it really is a reciprocal effort where everyone is trying to take care of Ajax. So I just want to say thank you. No question. All right, thanks, Lisa. Any other questions, comments to CAO Baker's report? Being done, I'll just, just speak quickly. And, and I've said this to you, Shane, but I'll just say it publicly. Um, I, I heard a good analogy the other day that I've used a couple of times, and that is we're we're building the plane as we fly it. 
and and that's sort of what's happening. This is uncharted territory, and um, I just can't say enough about how uh, thankful I am for our staff and all the work that you've done. I mean, this has been an incredibly complicated and difficult time, and you guys have really pulled together our senior management team, our emergency management group, and you guys have done such a great job. So I'm sure on behalf of everybody, I want to say publicly, thank you for all the work you've done. Um, and uh, I appreciate it. And uh, let's hope this doesn't go on too long. But uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bates, for your report. Um, if I may, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for your comments and thank you, uh, Council. Um, I, I do have to say that, uh, you know, I've been in, you know, with my emergency services background, I've been through a few disasters and managing disasters before, but nothing like this. This is quite interesting. And, but I have to say that um, very, very proud of our staff of how we came together uh, not only senior staff, but we have staff in a number of different areas that we felt were vital to be around that table. And, uh, and everybody's contributed 110% and they're all, uh, you know, we're all brainstorming and, and everybody has an equal voice around the table, which has enabled us to, to move the organization forward and make quick decisions and uh, move on things, which, which were really the, uh, the most difficult part of the first few weeks of this response. Uh, because things were changing and still are really, but things were changing. The landscape was changing on a daily basis with the announcements from the province and the federal government uh, and the different orders and, uh, and, and the different uh, responses that we had to make. Um, but uh, absolutely, uh, I, I think that uh, this, this going through this uh, pandemic uh, has made us stronger as a staff team and as a, also a team with council as well. And, and we as staff really appreciate all the support that council has given us and uh, you know, relied on us to make, uh, make the decisions that we've had to make and back us through this, uh, through this process. So um, I'm just going to uh, thank you all on behalf of all staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have moved by Councillor Tyler Moore and second by Councillor Bauer. With the report entitled HIS COVID-19 Response Update, you received information. Two, that the federal provincial governments be requested to provide operating support for municipalities either through the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy Program or a municipal specific grant. Three, that the federal government be requested to commit gas tax funding at or above 2018 19 levels. And four, that this report be forwarded to MP Mark Holland, Federal Minister of Finance Bill Morneau, Ontario Minister of Finance Rod Phillips, and Ontario Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing Steve Clark. And just to let Council know, uh, I did send off, I've sent off a lot of letters, but I did send off a letter recently to MP Holland exactly about this emergency wage subsidy program uh, and that it should be applied to municipalities. We are experiencing all the same issues that any other business is. We're having to do some staff layoffs. We're having to do a lot of things. We've had our revenue affected and that we've waived uh, penalties and interest on our property taxes, a number of other things. We've also lost our slots revenues. We've lost all our recreation funding uh, when we had to close our facilities. But at the same time, we are provincially legislated to maintain certain levels of service and we are not allowed to run a deficit. And all those things we can see on here uh, a net loss so far of about two and a half million dollars. And that's only in the first month. So it's pretty much impossible to, to not run a deficit when all these things are happening and when the federal subsidies that have come out so far don't include municipalities, it makes it even more challenging. So those letters have gone out just for the information of council and, and whoever's watching. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? None, thank you, it's carried. That concludes our departmental reports. Uh, regional council reports, I asked before the meeting if anybody had any, but we haven't really had any meetings. Does anybody have anything they wish to speak about from a regional perspective? It being none, I would just note that we did have a special regional council meeting uh, and it was held remotely by Zoom and all of, our current, all of our future meetings will be held remotely. We have canceled the... Um, committee meetings being finance planning works and health and social services because just like we're doing here at this council we're just bringing those reports straight to council and we're not having all those other meetings we also delegated a certain amount of authority to the cao and the chair of the region as we did here at the council 
So uh, anybody have anything to add to that? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, so we have moved by Regional Councilor Crawford, second by Regional Councilor Dyes, that the Regional Council's reports of April 20th, 2020 be received for information. Those in favor? Carried, thank you. Moving on to bylaws. Um, moved by Councilor Lease, Regional, Regional Council Lease, second by Councilor Bauer, the bylaws numbers 11 2020 to 14 2020 be read at first, second, third time and passed. Those first two are the bylaws, the tax bylaws, which reflect the changes we need to make to allow the waiving of penalties and interest for 60 days. Uh, and the other, again, are to do with the COVID-19. And of course, appointing Mr. McRealis in replace of uh, recently retired building inspector, um, head chief building inspector. Any questions or comments on the bylaws? Regional Councilor Crawford? Sorry, I just had one question on the parking permits. Um, are, are we still going through that process right now? Is this just for future uh, parking permits? I mean, I know we had a report before all this kind of thing blew up. I just, I'm just curious on, on the timing of this. Okay, Ms. Cooper? Yes, you're correct. So this is really just a housekeeping matter, just closing the loop from the um, additional fee that council already approved when you pull permits, permits in excess of 12. We're just getting it in place now um, to sort of bookend that matter, but um, there's a provision in the bylaw that allows for it not to be implemented right away. So once we get the software capable of handling the um, paid permit fees, and of course, once we're back to normal service levels, that's when you'll see this bylaw take effect. Okay, thank you so much. Any other questions or comments on the bylaws? Being none, those in favor? Those are carried, thank you. Now, we have taken out of this agenda announcements and also notice of motion. <laughs> I know there's no notice of motion. Does anybody have any announcements before I make one? Uh, Councillor Khan. Yes, um, this week it's going to be uh, the beginning of Ramadan for Muslims. So on behalf of Ajax Council and, and the Muslims of Ajax and, and Canada Worldwide, I want to wish um, everyone a happy Ramadan. Just be aware that this is the month of charity for Muslims and uh, hundreds and thousands of families will be opening their homes and their hearts to take care of the, uh, the, the, the most vulnerable. And um, so we will be looking out for that. There's going to be a flood of, of charity and donations within our community. So I just wanted to make us aware of that. and. Um, it's a great month for us. So on behalf of Ajax Council and on all of Ajax, happy Ramadan. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Tyler Moran, did you have your hand up? Uh, thank ahead. you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I was just going to uh, speak about what's happening this Saturday at 7 p.m., but you're going to tell them about that. I was going to talk about that. I'm looking forward to it. That's all I'm going to say. Anybody else before I make that announcement? Councilor Lee. Just that on Wednesday, it's Earth Day, and um, I believe... Um, you know, I understand that we're social distancing a total of um, six feet, not meters, um, from each other. But you know, if we, if you're going a, a walk along the trails, along the parks, you see some garbage, feel free to pick it up on that day of all days. Because I think, um, I think it's the 50th anniversary, and more than ever, it's really important that we continue to take care of our planet. And I think so far, you know, it's the one silver lining in this dark cloud is all the positive environmental benefits of having everyone stay at home, not drive. And so hopefully we can carry forward that momentum in other positive ways. So Wednesday's Earth Day, and please clean up if you have a chance. I'll be at Hermitage Park cleaning up there. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. It'll be my birthday, so I'll pick up something somewhere. Oh, and it's Lisa's birthday, too. On That's what I forgot. Birthday, birthday. birthday. <laughs> Had to throw that in there. <laughs> and we missed Kelsey Crawford's birthday yeah. a couple weeks ago. No need to. No need to worry about that. <laughs> All right, I will also be doing an Earth Day cleanup at 12.45, but I'll be at the Horn Cell Parkette. So I imagine we'll, we'll each be at different places because we have to do our social distancing. But just uh, thanks, sir. thank you, Councilor Tyler Morin, for leading in to my, my announcement. Uh, we have had to cancel the Ajax Mayor's Gala that was going to take place on June the 12th, which was expected. But as we talked about during the COVID-19 report by CO Baker, the need is very much still in our community yes. to raise funds. And um, due to the generosity of a lot of our local businesses, all the sponsors, I've been able to retain 
a large percentage of the of the funds were sponsors of the gala. That's and right. what we're going to do is on April the 25th, this Saturday at 7 p.m., I'm going to be holding an online event with hopefully all of council and a lot of special guests. It's going to be at 7 p.m. It's going to be on our Ajax Mayor's Gala Facebook page, uh, a live event. So it's facebook.com slash Ajax Gala, I believe, but it's, it's pretty easy to find. Um, we're going to have a lot. I don't want to give anything away, but there's going to be uh, a Mayor's Trivia Challenge and a few other things and a lot of special guests. So I'd like to invite everybody to join us. There is also going to be a way for viewers, instead of just the regular 200 or so people that go to these gala events, <clears throat> up to everybody. So we could have literally tens of thousands of residents from across the world if they wanted to. And there will be an option to uh, make donations by text as well. So we're gonna be able to benefit some, some really good local charities. The main ones we've chosen are Feed and Need Durham, of course, the food bank, which supplies the Salvation Army as well. Uh, Community Care Durham, which does the Seniors Meals on Wheels programs. Durham Children's Aid, of course, um, and, and Horizon House for domestic okay. violence. These are four charities that are um, become even more in need in times like this. So it's good to be able to put that money back in the community. So I hope you will all join us and it should be a fun night. And it goes from seven till eight. And then I think there's something after as well. So stay tuned, but hopefully you can join us then. Anything further from anybody? No. All right. Stay safe. Moving on to confirming bylaw, removed by Regional Councilor Dye, second by Regional Councilor Lee. The bylaw number 15-2020 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Ajax at its electronic meeting held on April 20, 2020, be read a first, second, and third time and passed. Any comments? Being none, those in favor? Let's see those hands, there we go, that's carried. Almost done. Finally, adjournment moved by Councillor Tyler Moore and second by Councillor Kahn that the April 20th, 2020 meeting of the Council of the Town of Ajax be adjourned. Those in favor? That's carried. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Good job, Alex. Bye.